Hello, my name is David Ernst. I'm the CEO of CIV, Secure Internet Voting. And I've been doing a lot of work for the last decade or so on digital democracy, democracy technology, decentralized governance, making governance systems that are inclusive and accountable and highly intelligent. What is a secure voting? Uh, is it yeah. the voting for the National Assembly, like Korean National Assembly voting? Exactly. And presidential sort of... Exactly. Uh, so what's tricky about voting is you have to ensure one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. You know, people can't create a thousand accounts. And then you need to... Be sure, however you plan to cast your vote, that it doesn't get changed or tampered with or lost. And so you need to have some verifiability of the results. And then the other part that's really surprising for a lot of people that most people don't think about is the privacy requirements. We can use credit cards and we can pay for lots of things online. But with those systems, your transactions go in a database somewhere. With voting, it's very important that there be no database of how everyone votes. We want to have strong privacy because that allows people to truly speak their minds without fear that they're going to be punished for how they vote. And so it's a, it's a tricky problem. How can you make sure who votes without knowing how they voted? And so that's part of what our technology helps to, helps to solve. Tell us more about your technology. Is it, is, do you use a blockchain to have a security? and AI for uh, whatever the, you know, functions? Yeah. Could you explain? Yeah, so it's, the, it's these three problems. It's, it's one person, one vote, privacy around the vote, and verifiability. And so for the verifiability, we do use a lot of technology that's similar to blockchains, but customized for voting. So with the Bitcoin blockchain, they use proof of work, where all the computers are doing all this mining and hashing and, and racing. And so that's, um, it kind of slows things down and it makes it very costly and it's just not necessary for voting because for voting, you do need to have a list of who's allowed to vote. And so it unfortunately does need to have some voter registration piece where you have the election administrators verify your identity. And so we, we get all the verifiability. We, we do use cryptographically secured public ledgers um, yeah, to secure the verifiability. But then we also have different tools where you can send everyone postcards in the mail with unique codes, or they can receive unique codes in person, or if they have email addresses on file, there's a, there's a whole menu of options for how you authenticate people. And then again, this tricky part is this privacy piece. And so what we do is we, we use this very um, innovative cryptography called a mix net like a mixture, like um, you're shuffling things up. And so the basic idea is that everybody sends in an encrypted vote and you can tell who each vote comes from, but you can't see the contents because it's protected by the strong cryptography. And then you have a million votes or, or all the votes and you can, ran, you can anonymize them and mix them all up using this thing called this cryptographic shuffle. And it's a really powerful tool that's not that widely, widely known but it allows you to, to solve the step of who voted without seeing how anyone votes. And so then once everything's been anonymized, all the encryption can get unlocked and everyone can see every last vote and everyone can recount and tally up the results for themselves. So there's no back room. There's no, you don't have to trust any administrators to, to tally up all the results correctly. Each and every voter can verify for themselves that their vote is in the final tally and they all add up correctly. And so you get far more transparency in the current process while still protecting each voter's privacy of how they're voting. So think about, you know, uh, Korean uh, election, which will take place 10th of April and uh, 50 million, you know, population and voters, I think it's about 35 million or 30 million in order to vote for their uh, district, you know, district representatives, uh, I think we have 300 reps. How much would it cost? Vastly cheaper than what, you're, than what paper systems work. Really? Much cheaper. I mean, 10 times cheaper. 10 times cheaper. Yeah, okay. because, and, and not just cheaper, but faster and more verifiable, and you can actually inspect the privacy. 
And so both cheaper and better, which is relatively rare. Usually you have to pay more for, for top of the line. And what's really exciting is just on the, I'll detail the cheaper side, but to run paper elections, it just requires so many humans to run all the polling locations, thousands and thousands of humans. And so it, with the digital election, you don't need that. It's like, it's like if the stock market was all running by paper, you need so many more humans. But in digital, you know, people can spend, billions of people connect to YouTube every day. It's not like you need a human to serve every video. So in general, computers can make things so much cheaper. But then what's really interesting is once, the, this is kind of meant as step one to get our basic democratic right in cyberspace. Right now our governments don't really recognize us in a digital setting. We can oftentimes pay our taxes online, but we can't express our voice online. And so this is our, this is our very fundamental basic thing that makes a democracy is our ability to vote. And so once we can upgrade our, our voting to cyberspace, then we can start to do far more interesting things with our representative system. And so here we are at this AI summit. So one thing that some of the earlier speakers were talking about is having a personal AI that could represent you and study all the policy issues that you care the most about and advocate on your behalf all day long, even while you're busy at work and doing other things. And so that becomes possible once you have digital representation and digital identity and your, and your government actually recognizes your voice. And so that's one example. There's, there's a whole bunch of other new opportunities that open up once we have, um, once we have a right to vote in, in cyberspace. And so it's, it's very powerful for yeah. bringing our democracies into the information age, into the 21st century. Okay, uh, think about you know, 30,000, 30 million are voting. How much? Cost? Yeah, very roughly, very roughly. It doesn't have to be exact. In, in the U.S., I, I'm not exactly sure about Korea, but in the U.S., the U.S. government spends $4 billion every year for 200 million voters. So it's about $20 per voter. $4 billion for 200 million voters. So $20 per voter on average. And so that's in the current paper system. And so in a digital setting, just the, the initial time, you can get that down to $2 per person. So 90, 10, 10 times cheaper, 90% cost saving, easily. And then after you do it the first time, it actually gets cheaper and cheaper each subsequent time because you can reuse. There's a lot of pieces that you can reuse. It's really just getting people set up the first time is the expensive part. And so it's like, it's like the cost of sending a letter versus the cost of sending an email. You know, it's radically cheaper. And so same thing here. And yeah, around the world, all the governments of the world are spending somewhere on the order of about $50 billion right now to run secure, to carry out secure elections. Mm -hmm. And so you can both get that cost down and achieve higher levels of security mm -hmm. because now any, any individual voter can, can actually check the results for themselves and can make sure their vote didn't get lost. Their vote where, didn't get changed. Where do they you know, vote? On the you know, computer or mobile? Yeah, on their own phone, on their own laptop. You know, if you have a smartphone in your pocket, yeah. on whatever device you're most comfortable with, in your own home, on an iPad, on a foldable, fancy foldable Samsung phones, yeah. which everybody loves these days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's not, just to be clear, nobody has to vote digitally. It's an additional option. If people like sticking with the paper options, they can continue using it. It's, it's compatible alongside the existing options. And so people that don't feel comfortable with it for whatever reason, nobody's forced into it. It's just an extra option. Okay, uh, have you, is that the use case? Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah, so we've run about eight or so elections in the U.S. now, including, elections? yeah, something like that, real elections. I mean, we've run hundreds of, of pilot, ele of, of test elections, demo elections, but something like eight or so real elections, including the, our biggest one was a congressional election. So there's now, as of about three months ago, there was someone sworn into the U.S. Congress, the U.S. House of Representatives, 
who we ran their primary using secure internet voting. And everybody loved it. Every, everybody, they had done it, they, this was in Utah, and everybody there had used our system a few times before this, and they all saw how much faster it was, how much easier it was. You know, it just takes them seconds, you just make your options, and then they can, they had this quote, there were a lot of people that said, you know, we were really skeptical about this. Uh, I, there was a group of people that were very, you know, there's a lot of fear for very good reason. It's our, it's our government system. We can't, we can't mess around with it. We need to be very secure, of course. And so these people said, you know, we were skeptical, but now that we've seen it in action, they said, today we are all poll watchers. And we just love that quote so much. We've been quoting them. Today, now every single participant can be an observer in the election, can actually confirm that everything went correctly, step by step. And if there are any problems, you also can fix them. Unlike in our current paper systems, if there's a problem, you just have to throw away the entire election and start over. In a digital system, you have a backspace key. And so if there are any problems, you can say, okay, we're just gonna reissue, that, that voter had some issues, so we're gonna um, invalidate that particular voter credentials and issue them a new one, and they can just fix it and do it again. So you get much more precision. So yeah, it's been, that's been one of the great things is a lot of people, for very good reason, are skeptical, but once they try it, they're, they're like, of course I wanna do this. You know, it's, do you know whether a, a Korean company doing what you're doing? I don't know of any Korean ones off the top of my head. We, we are working internationally, though. We're, we're talking with the Indian government next week. We've done a lot of work with uh, talking with the Montenegrin government, um, some with the Guatemalan government. So we're, we're more than happy to help, help Korean government and Korean people. Yeah, and all the technology itself is all documented and explained step by step. There's, there's a lot of technical details and nobody needs to study it, but it's all available if anyone wants to dig deeper into each step of exactly how it works. If there's any demand in, in South Korea, do you travel to South Korea? Absolutely. One of my closest friends lived in Seoul for many years and then Busan, and he says, I have to go visit. He says, it's, he says it's an incredible place. And so I've been meaning to come visit for a long time. Yeah, yeah I would love that opportunity. Wow, very good. So yeah. You, you sort of, how many days can you stay? In Korea? Yeah, if you come. As long as it takes. I mean, we, we, want, we want people to be able to see it actually working. And so we're willing to, to do what we can do on our end to make sure it's working great for everybody. Where can I get more information? Yeah, the best place is... Can yeah. you send me some information for me to uh, contact the Korean government? Yeah, can so... It, there, uh, yeah, it's siv.org. Siv. O o yeah. And so that's our, our website, Secure Internet Voting. And so we have lots and lots of information. There's a link right at the top called Docs. And we have a whole book. It's like 150 pages worth of information and it digs into every last detail. There's a lot of, for, for very good reason, there's people in the election security community that have identified all these different types of attacks that people are worried about. And so we've shown step-by-step, step, here's how we protect against this attack, here's how you defend against this one, here's how you can run these post-election audits. You can actually, you can, you can verify the election after the facts with like a thousand X the efficiency of what you can do with paper elections because you can go vote by vote instead of just these large statistical samples. Did anybody come to you to talk to, you know, about what to do from Korea? Yeah. Um, we had some people come and talk to us a few years ago when we were focused more on decentralized representation. Yeah, we had um, a number of journalists come out We were because we were running for office promoting these ideas around decentralized digital representative democracy. And so we did some really cool interviews. With, yeah, it was really exciting. Um, and yeah, there was a lot of interest. Um, for Civ specifically, it's a, it's, a more, it's a newer company. We just started at the start of the pandemic. Because of the pandemic, it, it screwed up a lot of our in-person voting. And so this work, a lot of the key uh, a lot of the key research was actually discovered in the early 2000s, in 2001. 
but most people didn't know about it. And so at the start of the pandemic, we wanted to just create very simple explainers that took these complex cryptography PhDs and made them very simple, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And so we, we created these and we shared them and they very quickly got up to high levels in American government. And so our response was, the response that we heard was, this is really interesting, but we need to see it actually working. And so then we started building it. And so just in the last two years, now we have the system fully working. So yeah, we're excited to bring it to, to anyone all over the world. All the, there's 71 or so democracies around the world and we, we want every democratic country to have access to it. Do you think you could have a, a Korean uh, representative or something? Yeah. yeah. You're saying would we, would we have an employee specifically or, or have representatives that live in Korea to advocate for this? Yeah, something like that. It, it, this is not like a coffee or, you know, <laughs> bread to show them buy it. It's uh, a lot of time to explain it. Time to answer questions and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we're um, yeah, we're we're 100% open and excited about that.